Management Department, Honorable the Secretaries of Management Department, and Honorable our Speakers, Moderator, and all participants by Zoom online and offline. I'm Stephanie Burin, Master of Ceremony of today. On behalf of the organizing committee, we extend our appreciation for your presence today. First of all, let us praise to the Almighty Jesus Christ because of his blessing we are able to attend this event. And then we continue with prayer, will be led by Frater Sarnos. Dear brothers and sisters and dear speakers, let us bow our heads and put ourselves in the holiness of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And allow me to offer the opening prayer. Recording in progress. According to the Catholic faith. For brothers and sisters of non-Catholic beliefs, please pray according to your own beliefs. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Spirit. Amen. O God, the most holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, humans in various parts of the world are facing the threat of a global economic recession that will impact various areas of our life. You also know how fragile and helpless we are, and anxiety clouds that cover our view. The world's possibilities are always looming. However, we trust in your divine providence because you yourself once said, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Because of believing in your word, Catholic Vidya Mandira University, there is to organize an international seminar. You yourself have also given us the mind to think and to decide the right choices for our life. For this reason, through this seminar, we endeavor to critically read the signs of the times, specifically the global economic recession, so that we are able to find the best strategy of recovery in order to save ourselves and the marginalized who are vulnerable to becoming victims. May your Holy Spirit inspire the speakers of this seminar so that they only speak what is true and good according to your own will. Bless all of us who attended this seminar and the whole series of seminars so that this seminar runs well. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you, Frater Sarnus. The honorable, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, to honor our country, let us all rise for the listening of Indonesian national anthem, Indonesia Raya.
Ladies and gentlemen, step on to following agenda our speech. Welcoming speech will be delivered by Rektor Widya Mandira Katolik University, Pater Dr. Filipus Tule, SVD. Dear Pater Rektor, time is yours. Salvete, salom, assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Om swastiastu, namo buddhaya, salam sejahtera for all of us. Good morning ladies and gentlemen, honorable Dean of Faculty of Economic and Business, Widya Mandira Catholic University, the Head of Management Study Program, Honorable Keynote Speaker, Mr. Fernando Martino, and fellow speakers, Dr. Ana Siswanto Anwar, Vice Dean of Economic and Business Faculty from Hasanuddin University. And also Mr. Felix Ui, CEO, Tarim Capital from Malaysia. And dear participants, both online and offline, dear lecturers, staff, and students. While thanking God, for his blessings and protection for us, I am pleased to address and welcome you all to this international seminar. First of all, I hope that all of you are keeping well. Our economic crisis and recession today is unpredictable. And we hope that our government authorities and citizens will be able to cope with it and overcome this economic crisis together. Today, in this academic forum, our focus is on the threat of global recession on cooperative and small medium enterprises. Many countries, including Indonesia, Malaysia, and East Timor, have been preparing to face the economic challenges for some time. For example, various tests laid out by the financial crash of 2007 and 8, pandemic COVID-19, and also Russia-Ukraine war recently. Scholars and researchers have put in place structures to solve the crisis. For example, with a single supervisory mechanism by the European economic community. With small medium enterprises, with credit union, and many others. All these alternatives have a clear vision to ensure financial stability in our countries. I am pleased to see that some of those issues will be brought up for discussion today. In today's event, the international seminar, we have five academic papers will be presented and discussed. Our keynote speaker, Mr. Fernando Martino from Cooperative State Secretary of East Timor, will speak about the context of cooperative history and its contribution to economics. Two other speakers, Dr. Anas Iswanto Anwar, Vice Dean of Economic and Business Faculty from Hasanuddin University, and Dr. Pedro Simenes, Rector of IUB, East Timor, will discuss how cooperative and small medium enterprises will contribute to Indonesia and East Timor economy during recession. 
Then in the last session, we will hear thoughts of Mr. Felix Uy about entrepreneur scope of 2023 recession threats. In addition to these topics, I am eagerly looking forward to another topic, dealing with the long running issue of the one ethnic group of Timorese who share the same social cultural heritage but divided in nationalities by political boundaries, characterized by various social economic problems, including the economic discrepancies and cross-border trade problems. That is why one of our central problem to be tackled is the issue of keeping the relations or bridges between these two nations, since it remains a complicated issue in the midst of this global recession, where improvements and urgent solution are required. I would say this to the cooperative and small medium enterprises sector. A stitch in time saves nine. So we have to deal with it sooner rather than later. We are all aware that the 2023 recession may disrupt the import cycle and distribution of some of the raw materials needed by the small medium enterprises. Thus, we believe that the local materials can be an alternative. The government should continue to cooperate with various parties so that the supply and the inter-island and international raw materials trade, especially between West and East Timor, can be optimized. We also acknowledge that small medium enterprises depending on imported commodities may face difficulties as well. But we are sure that they will survive because our respective government has determined to help small medium enterprises sectors to obtain raw materials, easy license and certificates, and training the actors in order to boost their selling power. The government, the academics in various universities, and especially the cooperative and small medium enterprises ministry, should also keep encouraging the use of digital platform and optimizing the microcredit program to help actors in need of additional capital. My dear speakers, participants, and students, finally and naturally, the purpose of this international seminar today is to look at solutions to the current challenges we face. That's why to end my opening words, I can strike an optimistic note that our academic collaboration has a clear destination to ensure stability in our economic and financial system. So we must work hard to get on to reach this destination. I would like to express my words of thanks. Once again, we have experienced good collaboration between Unvira University, with University of Hasanuddin, and also with Institute of Business, Dili. In particular, I want to thank all those from the academic world who have been involved in preparing the speeches and papers to be discussed today. It is not easy to develop a program like this and do all the coordination that is required to such a blended activity 
a blended event like now, when we are working remotely, but as the adage goes, where there is a will, there is a way. My dear speakers and participants, so welcome and once again to each of you. We have hundreds of people connected today, which is great to see and communicate both online and offline. With these optimistic ideas and dreams, we invoke God's blessings of Pastor Saint Arnold. I formally open up the International Seminar 2023, hosted by the Faculty of Economic and Business uh, Management Study Program, Vidya Mandira Catholic University, with a team threat of global recession on cooperative and small medium enterprises 2023. May God bless you all. Thank you, Pate Rector, for the enlightening speech and for the officially opening of the seminar. Ladies and gentlemen, for the documentation, we are going to have a photo session. To all participants in Zoom online, you can turn on your video so our team can take a picture. For the next, for the first slide, In Zoom online, participants can turn on video. One, two, three, smile. The next slide. One, okay, one, two, three, and smile. Okay, next slide. Okay, one, two, three, and smile. And the last slide. Okay. One, two, two, three, and smile. Okay, thank you. For the next agenda, I want to introduce our moderator today. I will make a brief introduction introduction about our moderator. Eugenius Dwi Ardika Irianto work as a lecturer, Faculty of Economic and Business of William Mandira Catholic University. He took his Bachelor of Philosophy at SAFK Ladelero in 2011. Meanwhile, his master degree was from Master of Theology at SAFK Ladelero in 2015 and Master of Management with the Mandira Catholic University in 2022. Without further ado, let us now start our program by welcoming our moderator for today. Please welcome. Pater Eugenius Dwi Ardika Irianto, and time is yours. 
Thank you very much, Ms. Ega, for your introduction. A very good morning to you all, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this international seminar. My name is Eugenius Dwi Ardika Irianto. You can call me Dito. I'm honored to serve you as your moderator of this seminar this morning. Our main topic of this discussion is the threat of the global recession on cooperatives and small medium enterprises in 2023. To shed light on this critical issue, we are joined this morning by a panel of esteemed experts who will share their views and insight on this topic. As a moderator, a quick reminder, I'm responsible for facilitating two main sessions. Firstly, the presentation session that will commence with a speech from our distinguished keynote speaker, followed by the presentation from our speak, first speaker through third speaker. And secondly, I will moderate the Q&A session to encourage all participants, active participation from all seminar participants. So without further ado, let us begin our first section with our keynote speaker, Mr. The Honorable Fernando Martino. Hello, Mr. Martino, good morning. Can you hear me? Okay, let me read a brief curriculum vitae of our keynote speaker. Mr. Fernando Martino, a Portuguese national, holds a degree in cooperative management and has extensive experience in this field. He is currently serving as the board president of Academy Jose Moreira da Silva, a social economy studies cooperative based in Portugal. In addition, Mr. Martino has also served as a member of Syriac International, Punta Coop, and IFRS International. All this highlighting his expertise and involvement in the field of cooperative management and other areas. So let us welcome our keynote speaker to the virtual stage. Mr. Martino, please. Hello. It seems that our Queen speaker speaker has a difficulty, technical difficulty to join with us today. Our committee, please make sure that our keynote speaker stay connected with us this morning. Okay, because of technical difficulties, we move on to the first speaker. And later on, we can find our keynote speaker to present his materials after the difficulty issue can be solved. So let us move on because our first speaker, Mr. Anas Anwar, has already been here with us. So I give the chance for the first presentation to our first speaker. Hello, Pak Anas, selamat ya. pagi. Ya. Bisa dengar saya? Ya, jelas. Suara saya jelas juga. Thank you. Iya, jelas sekali, Pak. Thank you very much. Baik. Before Mr. Anas presented his materials, 
let me read a brief curriculum video of our distinguished speaker today. Mr. Anas is Wanto Anwar. Pursue his undergraduate at Asenudin University. Completed his postgraduate study at Griffith University, Queensland, Australia, and earned his doctorate degree at Hasanuddin University. Since 1989, he has been serving as a lecturer at Faculty of Economic and Business, Hasanuddin University, and currently holds the position of the Peter Dean for Partnership, Research, and Innovation. Mr. Anas, academic credential are evidenced by various certificate of competency, professional experience beyond his role as lecturer, affiliation with organization, intellectual property right, publication, book, and award. Furthermore, he has produced numerous research publication, community service project, and participated in scientific seminar and training program. So with honor, let us welcome Pak. Anas, ya, uh, uh, sorry saya dapat notifikasi ada time left lagi ini tiga menit apa ya kok begitu ya nanti terputus enggak ya halo no tidak apa apa tolong kasih tidak apa apa ya iya tolong kos please supaya saya bisa yeah. our committee please make Mr Anas to be co-host yes. Zoom. Not yet. Panas? Ya, ya, sebentar. Sebentar. Sudah kelihatan? Sudah kelihatan saya punya PPT? Sudah, Pak. Ya, sudah. Oke, oh, okay. baik. Baik. Cuman saya khawatir ini akan berhenti di dua menit ini. Cuman saya tidak mengerti ini ada time lapse. Enggak apa-apa ya, saya jalan aja ya. Baik, thanks uh, moderator, Mr. Uh, Dito. Good morning everyone. Let me uh, tell you a little bit about uh, myself. My name is Anas. I am lecturer at uh, Faculty of Economic and Business at Sunodin University. And also I would like to say thanks to uh, management department, Faculty of Economic and Business Media Mandiri uh, Catholic University, Unwira Kupang, for uh, inviting me for the international uh, seminar today. In my presentation, we are going to discuss about uh, threat of global recession, a uh, focus on Uh, corporative and small medium enterprises or SMES in 2023. I plan to speak uh, maybe about uh, 15 or 20 minutes. I would sure to be glad to answer any questions at the end of my presentation. So please hold your question if you uh, have uh, any. Ladies and gentlemen, outline my presentation. I have divided my talk into a uh, five section. Uh, first, I will explain to you about what is global recession, and uh, on of course some definition for that and the process, uh, the process of recession. Then I will explain the trigger of global recession is so important for us 
uh, next about Indonesia can survive threat of global recession. And finally, you will know how can you uh, how can cooperative and uh, SMES will survive in the global uh, recession.
Okay, panas. If I have star, please let me know, please. Yes. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, panas. Yeah, yeah, I say too. Okay, well, I'm continuing. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the, the more important now, uh, the questions, uh, is recession coming in 2023? I think uh, if we look at the the discuss uh, recently, uh, many advisor or economists yeah, try to explain uh, to us uh, about uh, is recession coming in uh, 23. Uh, let me start uh, to uh, introduce introduction for my presentation is uh, early warnings about the recession. If you know that various uh, global financial institutions, uh, likely uh, INF, uh, also World Bank, uh, have issue and give us uh, like early warnings about the possibility of global economic recession in 2023. And also, uh, quote from Investopedia, recession is a condition in which a country's economy is slowing down significantly for a long period of time. And also, According to uh, Bank, uh, Bank Indonesia, inflation is the continuous increase of goods and services prices during a period of time. Inflation is not always bad if it still occurs within a reasonable uh, limit of each country's national economy. For example, the United States targets uh, 2% of inflation yearly. Uh, Indonesia uh, targets 4%, and while uh, Turkey targets uh, 5% in one year. Uh, I will try to explain the process of recession. Firstly, uh, like the situation currently that high inflation was support uh, was spurred by rising food and energy prices and then production prices go up and demand uh, goes down the central bank respond by raising the benchmark interest rate and followed by another uh, uh, central bank. And then, of course, credit interest rate 
is rise and disrupt economic growth. This is the process of the uh, recession. What is global recession and also trigger of current uh, situation? Julius Siskin says that the most popular was two consecutive consecutive quarters of the client GDP. This uh, uh, definition, uh, many, many uh, people uh, follow this, uh, uh, what the Julius Siskin says, two quarters of declining GDP. And definition for NBR say that a significant decline in economic activities spread across the economy, lasting more than a few months, normally visible in Terones 2015, says that a global recession is defined as a contraction in annual global real per capita of GDP. If you look at the, the history of the recession, in 1975, if we know that a shock to oil prices from the Arab Embargo Initiative in October 1923 until 1920, uh, uh, 1974. And in uh, as we know that sharp tightening of monetary policy in the United States and other advanced economic to reduce inflation. And the next uh, recession in 1991, uh, banking crisis in Europe and transition in East uh, Europe. And then uh, 29, as we know that uh, financial crisis uh, since Great Depression in the United States too. And 2020, uh, triggered by the COVID-19 pandemic and lead to the third contraction in uh, global uh, GDP. We can see this uh, table about the projection for the economic growth of several countries in the world in 2023. The economic projection for the 2023 tend to be revised. All countries uh, make revises up for the developed country, while some for developing countries are revised down. Economic growth in 2023 will be mainly influenced by the handling of COVID-19 and the government's decision to reduce or uh, stop uh, stimulus. The next slide, we can see uh, why is inflation uh, so high? If we look at the graph, yeah, the shift of aggregate supply and also aggregate demand, yeah, uh, uh, because of uh, shortage in labor and plus higher uh, the cost of input due to the war, and then government make all stimulus yeah, with offsetting effect from shift in demand and services. This is uh, uh, very important. The policies, uh, fiscal policies, and also demand policies for the all government to take uh, action.
five factor, factors behind high inflation now, as we know that uh, because of uh, supply chain bottlenecks and also shift in demand for good from services. And then stimulus and recovery shifts out uh, demand curve. And then uh, next labor shortage leading to leftward shift in supply curve. And the last uh, supply shock to food and energy to food to war in Ukraine. If we know that uh, the, war, the war of uh, Ukraine and Soviet is make the problem in economy uh, more difficult uh, recently. How about Indonesia uh, if we link to the uh, issue of the global recession in 2023? Of course, we have to look at the, the data of the current situation in Indonesia uh, now. The questions more important, uh, important now for the Indonesia okay, is Indonesia can survive threat of global recession. If you look at the picture one about the inflation in Indonesia, in overall, uh, the current of the inflation is still uh, not really uh, bad. Yeah? Uh, in year to year until July 22, yeah, uh, reached to 4.94, and for PPI in 11.77. If we look at the GDP, yeah, mainly for the uh, main industry and also uh, grow for the manufacturers and uh, subsectors for manufacturers from the 2018 to 2022, uh, uh, the, the first quarterly. If you look at the growth in the manufacturing sector has continued since the third quarter of 2021 and following a recovery in health and demand. Specifically, the transportation and warehousing sector uh, grow double digit. This is indicating that increase in the public confidence especially in tourism and travel, it's been uh, significantly. If you look at the next picture, yeah. this uh, show that how about the household consumption? As we know that the household consumption in uh, the 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 main uh, contribute for the Indonesian GDP is still stable. If you look at the picture for uh, the growth of household consumption uh, and components is not uh, uh, really bad, and also growth of investment and the main component. Uh, similarly, if you look at the uh, household consumption. Next, if you look at the composition of GDP yeah, and also the growth of credit, yeah, we can see that uh, mainly at the asset quality as reflected in the relative control for NPL ratio, it uh, slow. That means uh, 
the component of GDP and also the growth of credit is not uh, really, really uh, bad. How about the cooperative or onion and for the small, medium enterprises or SMES? This is a, a treat or opportunity. Some the impact, the impact that can be fall for the SMES business include the slowing down, of course, of uh, income and with a fatal risk, namely smart no longer operating. The decline in people's purchasing power and increase in the number of termination of employment and unemployment and also potential to cause expenses to be greater than income. That means unstable uh, cash flow. How about opportunity? If we talking about the opportunity for the cooperative uh, or union and also SMES, if we know that experience has proven that during previous difficult time, such as the 1998 crisis and the COVID-19 pandemic, SMES were at the forefront that could survive and become a solution in dealing with economic problem. According to data from the Ministry of Cooperative, Small and Medium Enterprises for 2018, the number of uh, SMES actors is uh, 64.2 million or uh, 19 point 99% of the number of business actors in Indonesia. This means that the SMES uh, are dominated by micro entrepreneurs in Indonesia. It depends, depends on the value of the dollar is small. There's the rise and fall in the value of the dollar is not uh, uh, have a major effect on the movement of smalls in Indonesia. This is the main reason why SMES are the solution in various economic uh, conditions. I will try to wrap, uh, make conclusion for the uh, my presentation. It seems that the event out the threat of global crisis continues for the time being development in several macroeconomics indicators in Indonesia are still quite conductive. Expect for the problem of inflation with an increasing trend. This conductive developmental condition can occur as a direct or indirect positive impact from several economic policies carried out by the relevant authorities, the government, the Ministry of Finance, Bank Indonesia, and other sectoral authorities. Awareness of the importance of cooperative and SMES in economic sustainability in Indonesia must be accompanied by policies and regulation from the government to be able to manage and enhance their role so that they can continue to grow and develop. The government also need to be partnered with banks, the private sector and BUMN, uh, government uh, enterprises, so that all these parties can create easily a sensible uh, capital schemes. Cooperative and SMES that start from small unit will certainly become a relative resilience. And you, uh, cooperative and smart as sector are re relatively able to survive. This is some references for my presentation. And well, thank you for listening and also thank you for attention. 
Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat. Thank you very much, Pak Anas, for insightful presentation. And let us give a big applause to our first speaker. As a quick reminder, as a moderator, I encourage to all the participants of this webinar to start writing your question, responding to the materials of our first speaker. You can type in the chat box of dialogue of Zoom. And also, if you want to ask directly to Mr. Anas, we just hold on until we enter the Q&A session. So thank you very much again to Pa Anas. I appreciated his materials, very insightful. And we hope these materials can encourage a insightful and also discussion in this webinar. Now we move on. I have to check our keynote speaker who have had difficulty entering and joining with us today. Hello. Mr. Fernando, are you have here? All righty. Make sure that our keynote speaker have. Oh, it seems that our keynote speaker is not with us. So we move on to our second speaker of this seminar today. Let us welcome. Honorable Dr. Pedro Simenes. Halo, Pak Pedro, selamat pagi. Good morning. You are still unmuted. Please make... Halo, Mr. Pedro. Can you unmute it yourself? Oh, you cannot. Oh, please. Sorry. Yeah, I'm not, yes, sorry. Yes, I'm not yes, connected. Yes, sorry about that. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you for the moderator. Thanks uh, for coming. Before you presenting your materials, let me introduce your curriculum vitae for introduction purposes. Our second speaker, Mr. Pedro, Pedro Simenes, is a national of East Timor and holds a bachelor's degree in electronic engineering, National Institute of Technology Malang, a master of management in finance from Parihiangan Catholic University, and a doctor of education from Flinder University, South Australia. Currently, Mr. Simenes holds various prestigious positions, including the Rector of Institute of Business, Team Lead of Hands Program Ministry of Education, Youth and Sport, a member of ANA Directive Council, a member of Technical and Tariff Council of National Water and Sanitation, and a Timor Leste Country Representative to ASEAN Quality Assurance Association, and also the President Board of TRASI. Klibur Matadalan Foundation, Governing Board for Institute of Business. That's the brief curriculum vitae. Thank you very much. Welcome. And let us welcome our second speaker, Pa Pedro, please. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, just want to confirm whether you can hear my voice before yes, I yes, dive yes, into the Yes, we can hear. Pa, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, uh, let me try to share the presentation before I getting into more of the details. Let me see if I can do that. All right. Uh, just to confirm, have you? Are you able yes. to see? Yes, we are able to see your presentation. presentation. Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Apologies for this uh, problem because of the internet uh, issue and so so forth and so on. Uh, let me start by. Um, extending uh, our deepest gratitude on behalf of the uh, Institute of Business uh, to the uh, management of uh, Universitas Katholik Widya Mandira Kupang, uh, especially to the uh, Faculty of uh, uh, Economic and Management for uh, 
uh, the willingness and then for the collaboration in uh, inviting IOB to be part of this presentation. It is indeed a very prestigious and a very uh, important forum so that we can uh, share some thoughts, especially with a very relevant issue regarding uh, cooperative and small medium uh, enterprises and how that will contribute. Now, uh, thank you for the first presentation who has uh, set the scene, which uh, allowed me for uh, to more getting into the, the, the deep dive, but I'll be very brief. Uh, I'll provide you with the uh, with, uh, detail of Timor-Leste context, uh, but then uh, I think we will we will we can uh, further elaborate the uh, uh, the the issue when we get into the discussion. Just to give you a, a little bit uh, glance of Timor Leste, I'm pretty sure that everyone uh, in this forum already uh, very familiar with uh, Timor Leste. We we are sharing one island. Uh, I think uh, between uh, Timor uh, West Timor and East Timor, and we practically are brothers and sisters, and then. We are connected in all forms uh, from uh, culture and all the other aspects. So just a brief glance of Timor-Leste. Uh, we have uh, 1.3 million of population. The Dili is the capital, as you already, and I'm pretty sure many have actually uh, visited uh, Timor-Leste. Sorry, uh, let me just do one thing first. Yeah. Um, the main industry, uh, the agriculture and oil and gas. Uh, in fact, the uh, agri uh, the agriculture, uh, the oil and gas actually accounts for almost eighty percent of uh, Timor Leste GDP. So Timor Timor Leste is one of the country with uh, the highest uh, dependency on oil and gas. Uh, in terms of the uh, the country size, is about uh, fifteen thousand square kilometers. So it's uh, very small. Uh, almost, uh, I think, uh, the size of uh, one of the smallest country uh, in 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 the world. Um, just to give you a little bit background and a little bit the context of the uh, small and medium enterprises in Timor Leste, uh, just allow me to do one thing first. I'm able to do this. Just give me a minute. Okay, um, just to give you a little bit uh, the background of the uh, of the Timor Leste uh, cooperative and small and medium enterprises in the current economic system. Uh, according to Timor Leste constitution, uh, cooperative and social sector are one of the form of economic uh, organization in Timor Leste beside public and private sector. So it is actually clearly uh, been uh, stipulated in constitution, the article 138 that mentioned that uh, Timor Leste economic system composes of three pillars or managers. Uh, these are the public sector, the private sector, and the cooperative and uh, social sector. Um, the government, uh, given the tourism, commerce, and, and industry, that are also at the same time uh, helping uh, in terms of like providing uh, assistance in the uh, economic sector. But just, just to give you a little bit also uh, the background and the situation in the, uh, uh, in the cooperative and small and micro uh, finance sector. In Timor-Leste, we have a, a total cooperative of 452. Most of the cooperative uh, you know, can be categorized into two main uh, areas or two main categories. Uh, we have 28% of these uh, cooperative uh, accredited. So this is uh, uh, another, another form of uh, uh, auditory institution. We also have a uh, 72% of this cooperative of 452 that are actually uh, primary or productive cooperative. There are 170,000, uh, almost 180,000 of the Timorese population that already become member of the cooperative. Uh, that's accounts for nine percent of Timor Leste population. Uh, of this uh, number of uh, cooperative member, uh, sixty-two percent are part of the uh, uh, productive uh, cooperative uh, area, whereas the remaining is uh, part of the uh, credit union. 
In terms of the total capital, around 37 uh, millions uh, of these uh, total uh, cooperative uh, has the asset in terms of the capital. Now, if we move to the uh, small and medium enterprises, uh, our VT or in terms of the uh, capital, as you can see, the capital formation by the uh, the private businesses, uh, in this case, the small and medium enterprises, only comprises of the uh, five percent of non uh, GDP oil per capita. So that's how how small it is the uh, the contribution of uh, small and medium enterprises to the overall uh, GDP in Timor Leste. Next slide, uh, some facts, and uh, at the same time, uh, I can say this is kind of like a, a potential uh, uh, for the country. Uh, but before even getting into that, uh, when we are talking about the recession, uh, probably I have to say that uh, we have uh, recently um, experienced one of the, the biggest recession uh, in the whole world. I think during the COVID-19, uh, 2021 22 i think the whole party and the whole country uh, even timor leste we experienced a recession and uh, i don't know how about the uh, the eastern part of the the western part of the timor but in the timor leste during 2020 uh, 21 and 22 the country actually uh, had a, a very negative uh, uh, economic growth of down to minus 6.5 percent that's to show even another level of recession so we already have that experience of recession and how the uh, small and medium enterprises actually behave during the recession um just to give you um an idea of uh, what is the uh, the timor leste economic situation in general so we have a gdp per capita of 1.7 million now uh, at the beginning, I have already explained that Timor Leste is one of the most uh, dependent country to the oil and gas. So, of these 1.7 million, the contribution of non-oil GDP is actually very small, around 10 to 15 percent. The maximum that we had uh, during our uh, history as a country is actually 20 percent. But in average, the non-oil GDP contribution to the whole country GDP is only average at 15%. So uh, that's just to give an impression how, how, how big is the, uh, the contribution of, uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the oil. The non-oil economic accounts only for 10% average. Sorry, I said 15 before, but it's actually 10%. And 90% uh, are mainly from, uh, from oil. Uh, the non-oil contributors that accounted for 10% mainly comes from the agriculture uh, sector, the remittances, the remittances are tenaga kerja asing, uh, tenaga kerja TKW. Uh, so these are the workers that are working actually in other countries. Just for your information, uh, Timorese uh, or East Timor has a, a big community of uh, uh, foreign Timor Leste that are actually working in other countries such as Portugal, uh, United Kingdom, Ireland, and their contribution to the GDP is actually quite significant in terms of a uh, number. We also have high trade deficit. Uh, so this is uh, just to give you uh, an idea. Uh, in 2020, uh, almost uh, the imported goods to Timor-Leste accounts for 1.7 million, almost 80% of our state budget. Just uh, to give you an idea of the staggering uh, in balance in terms of our trade deficit. Now, having said that, this is a challenge, this is a problem, but it is also an opportunity that small and medium enterprise uh, can potentially explore uh, during the recession because during the recession, uh, the imports uh, actually will be uh, at the declining part. Um, also, as part of that 1.7 billion in just 2020, uh, this is just to give you an information, we have an imported goods uh, in agriculture area that's account for 155.7 million. Again, this is also an opportunity for the small and medium enterprises to contribute during the, uh, the recession time. 
just to give you also uh, an example of uh, high dependency to external trade, Timor Leste national uh, rice consumption stands at 131,000 tons per year. That's according to Ministry of uh, Agriculture in 2022. Now, Timor Leste only has uh, a total of national production that can only cover up to 54% of the uh, internal demand for rice consumption. Again, it is a problem, it is an issue, but it is also at the same time offers an opportunity and uh, for the uh, small and medium enterprises to explore. Another uh, factor that I'd like to uh, highlight and emphasize is currently Timor Leste is facing what we call a fiscal cliff. Uh, having a, a country that is uh, dependently uh, a high dependency on the oil, uh, our sovereign funds is actually depleting. Uh, our current sovereign fund stands at 70.4 billion US dollars. And our current rate uh, of uh, state expenditure uh, average at uh, 2.1 to 2.5 billion every year. If the country continues to spend at the rate it's currently spending uh, without any new uh, revenue, uh, the current sovereign fund will be completely uh, spent or will completely be depleted by probably in seven to eight or maximum 10 years. This is, this is again a challenge there. Uh, that the country has to face. Now, I have only provided you with the uh, with the challenges, uh, with the uh, uh, problems, but uh, let me just to give you uh, some, um, just a small, uh, let's say success story that Timor Leste has achieved. Uh, one of is, is uh, we have actually managed in terms of like human capital to increase the uh, in the life expectancy age, Previously, uh, be uh, before 1998, the life expectancy in Timor Leste was only uh, 59, up to 59 years old. Now, after the independence, the life expectancy now rose to uh, 69 uh, years. So that's uh, a quite big uh, number in terms of our life expectancy. We have also scored some very positive uh, uh, social uh, indicators, such as. Uh, the high uh, level of uh, uh, school enrollment, uh, the, the improved uh, health uh, service and coverage. So all of that are also some of the uh, positive uh, uh, story that I can share. But I rather focus on the challenges so that we can think about uh, how can we explore these challenges. Now, having said all of those challenges, uh, uh, let me provide you with some uh, ideas of how uh, small, uh, medium enterprises and cooperative can actually uh, benefit or can actually explore uh, the opportunity. Now, one of the biggest challenges that Timor Leste is now facing is actually the human capital. Uh, Timor Leste has a very unique, uh, let's say, uh, population demography. Uh, we have of this 1.3 million of population almost 60% of the population uh, is actually aged below 35 years old, which is the, just to show how young the country is, how big the challenge is to deal with uh, the young generation. So I think the biggest challenge and the biggest asset, the biggest resources that uh, Timor-Leste needs uh, to uh, put attention on to improve is actually on the human capital, human resource. So as you can see, uh, below 35 years old is actually 74. Uh, Timor Leste, given the, the problem that we face with, uh, you know, uh, uh, how Timor Leste unable to actually uh, provide uh, rice and other agriculture uh, produce uh, to domestic uh, demand, uh, but at the same time, you know, the Timor Leste has a quite big land. It, there is a 509,000 5, hectares of land that are unused, but also at the same time, we have a local products, a local produce that can be grow easily 
like maize, rice, cassava, coffee, coconut, banana, techwood, mango, sweet potatoes, and so on. These are opportunity, uh, these are produce that can easily be uh, be um, be increased, uh, be uh, be given if it's given uh, uh, an attention, a proper attention, it, it can become an, in an industry. Uh, as the the western part of Timor Leste, the western part of the uh, the Timor Island in Kupang and so on. There is also a big potential for livestock. According to information, there are 2.3 million heads of cattle and birds. Now, this is also an area that uh, uh, are not being properly explored by the small and medium enterprises in Timor-Leste. Another sector, another area that can be further explored by Timor-Leste and in particular, the small and medium enterprises are the fishery and aquaculture. Now, this is an area that I would say are not being uh, explored, are not uh, are being neglected uh, by the government and also being neglected by small and medium enterprises uh, when they actually uh, offer a big opportunity uh, to increase uh, the livelihood of the people to contribute to the GDP. I think this is one of the area for the small and medium enterprises uh, uh, to explore. Just to conclude, um, given the, the today's um, today's topic, I would say that uh, uh, we have faced uh, one of the worst recession in 2021 and 2022. We have to we we learn from that experiences. We know that food security is one of the biggest challenge. With uh, with the collapse of the the worldwide uh, supply system, every country is actually in a great danger. If something of this uh, similar catastrophe eva event is to happen again in the near future, so as a country, Timor Leste needs to focus on ensuring there is a food security in the country. So, in the face of recession, uh, as a country, Timor Leste can surpass the challenge, and it is up to the small and medium enterprises to explore ways, to explore opportunities, uh, to be able to produce so that we can actually benefit it uh, from this challenge. I think with that, I will end my presentation today. Once again, excellent event that was being put together by Universal Media Mandara. And I beat you uh, uh, an, an excellent discussion. Thank you so much. Back to you, moderator. Thank you very much, Pedro. Let us give a big applause to our speakers. Thank you very much. Mr. Pedro have give a broad insight in the context of Timor Leste, how SMS can survive in a crisis situation and how dealing with opportunity and threat. I think it is very good insight as compared to materials of Mr. Anas in, in Indonesian context. We can collaborate and make this opportunity yield a fruitful result. So thank you very much again. Thank you very much, pa Pedro, for your materials. And now, because our committee have already contacted our keynote speaker, it seemed that he had a difficulty and technical difficulty to join with us. So. In this seminar, let's move on to our third speaker, Mr. Felix Oi. Hello, good morning, Mr. Felix. Hello, good morning, everyone. Hello. Uh, can Welcome. you see? Okay, let me share the screen. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Before you're sharing your screen, let me All right. Thank you. and make to the audience your brief curriculum vitae so that we can know you well. All right. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me uh, to this uh, seven this morning. I've been always wanting to visit the Kupang. Uh, I've been in, uh, invited by some friends, never got a chance to do so. So thank you for uh, the University Catholic Vidaya in Kupang to invite me. They're able to see everyone this morning. Okay, you're welcome. Um, so my name is Felix Oint. Um, we have been great. We have... 
Come again, sorry. Okay, okay. no, it's my time. Introduce, allow me to introduce yourself as our- Oh yes, yeah, please, please go ahead. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, all participants of this seminar, uh, uh, allow me to introduce our third speaker, Mr. Felix Oi. Mr. Felix Oi, a Malaysian national, obtained his Bachelor of Architecture degree from RMIT University, Melbourne, Australia. He currently serves as the CEO of Tarim Capital, which specializes in agricultural investing, development, and operating expertise in Southeast Asia. In addition, Mr. Oi serves as an advisor to the Peninsular Sumatra Business Exchange, and he is a director of Sid Penang. He also serves as a board member of Penang Legal Corporation. Previously, Mr. Oi served as the city councillor for the city of Penang Island, Malaysia, and was appointed as the chairman of the city planning and development standing committee. So, good morning once again. Let us welcome our honorable speaker, Mr. Felix Oi. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to try to look up for my slide. Uh, Please. Can you share your presentation? Yes, yeah, sorry, I'm trying to try to see. Can you see? You cannot see yet, right? No, no. Okay, a second, give me it. Okay, I got it, okay. Okay, we can see. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So, so um, our team and I has been working on this few uh, couple of projects in Indonesia for the last couple of years. And uh, particularly on working with cooperative in Indonesia. Um, uh, it's just like um, a very good, good opportunity this morning to tell uh, everyone about what we do in Indonesia. And I, I'm thankful, thankful to the previous speaker. Dr. Ennis and Dr. Petro has gone through uh, very detailed in terms of uh, what recession is and uh, the world economy outlook for the future, and also share a bit of experience on Emos Leslie and also what um, investment potential, particularly in Akita agriculture in Timos Leslie. So I understand the, world, uh, the topic today is about recession. Um, my presentation is going to be something quite simple and brief. On uh, I'm, going to talk, I'm, I'm going to talk more about um, the projects and what we do and what the solution we bring forward to Indonesia in terms of cooperative advancement and also in terms of developing a sustainable agribusiness in Indonesia. And uh, this slide shows that um, what recession is all about. And we've been talking about recession for the last couple of years, huh, particularly in the US. So um, recently, this World Economy Forum is so sort of saying that, you know, what if it's recession? So it depends on where are you in the world. So looking at this, this uh, chart, it's looking into that uh, South Asia and East Asia Pacific area, particularly Indonesia, India, Pakistan, Malaysia, we are likely to hit the last in terms of when recession hit. And when recession comes, then we everybody gets hit. But somehow, because due to the current factors and uh, being an emerging market, okay. and South Asia and Indonesia, particularly Indonesia, were likely not to be so heavily affected. And so it seems like we are looking okay in terms of this part of the world. Right. So I'll spend a couple of the next 10 minutes talking about uh, opportunities for the cooperative to go global. And we also touch a bit, a little bit on food security, as well mentioned by Dr. Petro just now, and how agri agriculture cooperative can leverage on this uh, uh, very distinct timing to bring uh, particularly cooperative Indonesia, SME Indonesia forward to meet the world demand in terms of provide food security. So now, um, we understand the food security is coming. 
And we understand also the, about the world's going to hit from 6 million, 10 million in a couple of years, in about say 20 years time. And uh, also the, because of this increase of population, um, our many food producer, we have to increase the production up to 70% to meet the world demand. So partly because of population growth, this is how our populations for the last 200 years has gone two times from 7.1 million, 7.9 million to 10 million. Uh, and then this, this uh, figure is going to be continued going up. And there are many factors that affected uh, the increase of uh, food insecurity in the world. And one of them is because of rise of middle class, where and also Indonesia is going to have 90 million of populations to go into consumer class, where the income is going to be increased and uh, for significantly, then probably they're likely to spend more, not only by spending more, and they're going to buy more expensive stuff and eat better food. And in doing, in doing so, uh, you also prep, put a lot of pressure on animal feed, where more food needs to be fed the animal animal in order to sustain the demand of human. So this is this is what's going to happen when increase uh, middle class, where also put a lot of pressures on food security. So these are many factors that cause worldwide shortage of food. And uh, apart from population growth and rising of middle class, there are also other things like urbanizations where more people moving to the to, to the city and then uh, in the city has no capacity to produce, produce food. Where, Food mostly come from the rural area. And um, so it, it, when we need a lot of transportation, logistic, and the cost of food is going to be higher. And of course, what stream weather, disaster, disaster, pandemic, what happened previously to our COVID-19. And many conflicts are what we see recently in Ukraine, Russian war, and of course, corruptions and uh, political stability. They also affect the production of food. So but today it's not a... Uh, uh, so, of course, today is not a forum that we talk about this topic, but I just want to bring it up to see what is the next trace of growth for opportunity for Cooperative Indonesia or even Timor Leslie to go forward and capitalize on this opportunity of world demand. And this is a sustainable development goals by the United, uh, United Nations, where, where they put first thing stress on no poverty, no hunger. And this is one thing the priority of uh, our uh, United Nations. And this is what we, our company is doing right now, particularly with Cooperative Indonesia. And there's a lot of big fund up there talking about impact investing. And many, we can see many funds coming in all over the world uh, to a certain locations where we're able to provide solution to fulfill the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. For example, carbon credit, uh, clean water, and I think Indonesia, Timor Leste, or in Southeast Asia, we have plenty of opportunity for investors from all the world come come in to help us develop and eventually benefiting the world. And come back to Indonesia. Um, what actually brought us to Indonesia uh, from Malaysia is uh, we are very close to each other. And uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, like a, like a brother. You know, we only rivalry in terms of football and uh, badminton. Other than that, we are. We're sharing a lot of similarity in terms of languages, in terms of culture, in terms of food. So we know that Indonesia is going to be the largest, uh, it's already the largest economy in Southeast Asia. And um, it's a world leading food producer in the world by exporting uh, uh, community like um, palm oil and many other, many other uh, agricultural crops. And forty percent of about forty or fifty percent of the rural populations are in uh, farmers, are food producers. So, this is right as as the food crisis is looming, and uh, the world is shortage of shortages of uh, raw material for food. And it's bring us to Indonesia to working together with uh, any cooperative and only any partners to develop an industry, uh, for food. And food supply change. And currently, Indonesia still have uh, 36.8 million hectares of uh, underdeveloped land, we have yet to be cultivated. They have vast land um, that uh, Indonesia provide and doing in a sustainable way to continue continuous growth without affecting the environment, uh, deteriorating the environment further, like what we did, what we see in Vietnam and China, where most of the land is polluted. 
But Indonesia has this such a big, huge of uh, virgin land, which for agricultural purposes, that we have to start to do it correctly, sustainably, so that it can continue to prosper. And um, one of one of uh, uh, this is a um, sorry, this is a. Um, Another map showing that the resort, Indonesia is uh, something full of, uh, a country that's full of natural resources from all, from the 17,000, 17,000 island all across the archipelago. And this is uh, something that the world is very envy about. But yet, I think what will happen now is we will face a lot of problem in terms of geography, in terms of energy, in terms of logistic, to develop it further. But however, um, it's full of resources. And also not only for the land resources, but also for marine resources, uh, particularly on the South China Sea and somewhere uh, further down south of Philippines. A, lot, a large stock of fishery, uh, which is untapped and uh, it's being protected as well. And I think Indonesia is government doing well Current uh, is as improving in terms of sustainable fishery Indonesia. Uh, this is something also we are looking into uh, to help Indonesia to further uh, explore yeah. and developing. So now I'll, I'm going to share a little experience of uh, Indonesia Indonesia experience and how we work together with cooperative Indonesia and uh, this is a cooperative we work with. Um, our team we've been working with them for the last sixteen years. Uh, most most of the time I spend is to understand the need, and when we travel uh, deeply to the cop, uh, to the villages and rural, visiting the farmers, understand uh, what is the actual conditions and what need to be helped. So this cooperative is non stranger to most of Indonesia as it's established in nineteen seventy three, a uh, very large cooperative and established, uh, and of course it's a it's an institution. It's a it's it's a uh, it's quite a large organizations which has consists of almost like 30 million members over the years and is let's say we are talking about uh, 30 member 30 million members and let's say his family will have uh, four people and we are talking about almost 60 million people are somehow related to such a cooperative and this is uh, one of some structure of cooperative uh, it's been uh, helping the farmers and they are helping the farmers in terms of creating business clinics and uh, uh, distributing fertilizer, um, provide education, provide uh, training, like what the, uh, even provide a uh, simpan pincham. Uh, this is a, a essential characteristic, essential role of, of a cooperative. And what next would be? This is how we bring us to Indonesia, where we are subscribed to the the vision of chairman Herman Wutun, uh, Orang Kupang juga. Um, he has the visions to to take the cooperative into the world stage by leveraging on the natural resources of Indonesia and what Indonesia can offer to the world, and at the same time uh, working out on a strategy of property eradication in every part of Indonesia, particularly to the members of the cooperative. And that's what brings forward Mr. David Wu from Taiwan, who is uh, who was an engineer by training and who has last extensive, ex extensive experience in agriculture, in trading, in manufacturing, and also marine and uh, chemical uh, science. He came forward to draw up a master planning, a blueprint for the cooperative growth for the next uh, 50 years. Now, cooperative is a very, this cooperative, uh, similar to other cooperative, is a web well, well structures of uh, people. Uh, uh, they have uh, 9,437 9, branches across 31 provinces of Indonesia, which has put us very strategic location and advantages to, to access to certain resources in terms of human capital on the crops or products that the world needs. For example, um, we do have, um, for example, the cooperative in Java Island would be the expertise are in vegetation plantation. Uh, the advantages of a cooperative member in Maluku will be on fishing. Uh, Kupang will be paddy. 
or even Sumatra with palm oil and other things as well. So this is a very strategic um, uh, organization and partnership for us to, uh, to come in to develop uh, value, value change for agriculture business. So this is what this is a similar structures. I will not go into very detail and explain who they are. And national, this is a national level. Indo Q is a HQ in based in Jakarta. Post school is a branches, branches across all the province in Indonesia. And these are the sub-branches. And uh, this is the normal functions of a cooperative in terms of supply fertilizer and all resources to the downstream. And uh, the downstreams, uh, the upstream productions of the vegetable and crops we sell over back to the cooperative and then to find market access, we do locally and overseas. So they do have a, a, so a, a Simba Pinjam, a Sim microcredit systems to help in cooperative. This cooperative has been running well for the last uh, 30, 40 years. And, um, and now they are preparing for the next phase of growth. Now, what the opportunity right now uh, we're talking about is about food. If we're talking about population, we're talking about increase of food prices for next decade. We're talking about how Indonesia has also benefited for last pandemic where GDP keep on sustaining on 5% because of the rising price of raw material um, and also increase in consumption in community consumptions. So there are huge potential right now uh, on food security and food and agriculture industry. And what we did now is uh, to find uh, partners together with uh, international partners, other local partners, international partners, to insert professional management, new technology, such as uh, IT, digital, um, affordable uh, and adaptable uh, agriculture technology, and how to help the cooperative from the, uh, the upstream moving up to the value change of the food supply and finding global market success, uh, sorry, global market access in terms of what providing more raw material within the region. Where we, have, for example, in Malaysia, we do have a, a quite sustainable mature food value change where we import uh, raw material from all over the world, from Brazil, from South Africa, Nigeria. And yet, there are proximity of Indonesia where can supply to Malaysia, but it requires a huge uh, capital investment to develop a value change. So, so what happened now is I think Indonesia can also most importantly focus on the local productions and how it can uh, provide uh, as a regional raw material supplier to, uh, to nearby country. And of course, once again, about local and foreign investment. So now we are, our effort right now is to how to help the corporation to move up to the value change by increase the productions of um, productivity on the ground, in, namely the crops. Then uh, we will find the fund and the uh, financial capacity to to the to help the cooperative to continue to get involved in the manufacturing, logistic, and marketing process. And this is how I think what the cooperatives can do at this time when we able to partner in terms of fundraising, uh, looking for the right partners and help them to moving out so that cooperative can continue to be diversified into further up the downstreams and uh, create a food ecosystem for the cooperative alone. So this is a business model. Uh, I'm kind of briefly going through about this model, about how do we, uh, as, as a private corporation, uh, come to Indonesia and partnership a cooperative, leveraging on the capital market, leveraging on the technologies that we have uh, by, by uh, organizing, uh, introducing new technology to the cooperative members, and also leveraging on the natural resources and uh, one competitive advantage of the cooperative member by insert by forming a corporation and putting together a good management team, technology, 
and with the international market that we have together the foreign fund that, that we have secure and helping into Kode and to go into the next phase of growth and to create this what we call the food platform for the cooperative. So this is another uh, chart showing that uh, a different shape between a partnership and cooperative. So in this partnership that we are working with, the cooperative is cooperative maintained as cooperative itself and the joint venture remain as a uh, private entity where we with a joint venture company with the cooperative, where the cooperative will develop into a different items or projects, including uh, plantation, manufacturing, e-wallet in terms of digital um, financial system, uh, fintech, um, also educations, uh, property development, and this is the, this is the, the structures of joint ventures where it doesn't uh, affect the normal running of the cooperative in terms of creating, uh, provide goods and services, provide uh, facilities, provide education to members. And this one is run separately and yet it benefits the cooperative itself. So this is the picture showing that huh, um, to a lot of cooperative, uh, the involvement of food producer uh, producing is only restricted to farming or even for um, basic packaging. It doesn't evolve on to the whole value chain and uh, value chain. And what we propose right now to the cooperative is to get the cooperative involved in every part of this uh, uh, value chain so that it can complete the whole picture, whole pictures of the food uh, and agriculture uh, value change. And this is, I, I think in the long run, these will def, definitely moving, help the cooperative to move to world market and, and create great influence in terms of food supply to the world. And therefore we are saying that Indonesia can be the food basket of the world if it's developed properly, if the right capital is coming in uh, to exist in every aspect of the value change and by capitalizing on human capital and the talent of Indonesia, and this is possible. So for, in order to create this uh, food platform and a sustainable agri agribusiness model, our company has lined up 10 projects that we are, embark we are going to emb embark on uh, that uh, to create a food ecosystem to cooperative. Number one is cassava. Cassava is staple food, and this is something very simple in uh, for Indonesia. And this is a world huge demand. And subsequently, uh, some vegetable plantations and then uh, palm oil is what Indonesia famous of not restricted to the plantation but we also will be going into fishery to leveraging on the natural resources um, sea resources of the Indonesia by building what 10,000 boats uh, by setting up a boat factory in uh, places like Maluku and, uh, or Batam and we were, we will get investors. We have investors, and uh, we personally invest into uh, boat building projects in Indonesia, and subsequently aquaculture as well. And I'm going to start to show a few things uh, more detail about this project later on. And poultry, uh, any a poultry and livestock projects also that we will be embarked on, and um, and also for uh, mining. Uh, this is a very important aspect rural digitalizations and finding uh, digital access and also financial access into the rural area for the cooperative for further developed and provide uh, financial assistance and subsequently develop into an industrial zone. Uh, this is all of a, um, a simple summary of what we're going to plan to do. Um, I might not have time to go through a single item, but this in the long run is talking about um, helping the cooperative of Indonesia to complete whole picture value change. And therefore, um, it can be self-sustained. And it, it and then um, this is how we can, our contribution to helping um, the national agenda of erecting poverty and upgrading and improving the well-being of the members and bring further um, 
uh, development in the rural area by providing uh, more facilities in, in terms of energy, water, education, and hospital medical services. Now I'm going to show you a, a little, a, 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 some of the real projects that we are doing right now. Uh, we understand Indonesia uh, largely in the remote island and remote area shortage of uh, electrification. Not only electrification for household, but also electrification for industry. And this is one of the reasons that even though uh, places like Indonesia who have large rental resources, but still yet not able to develop because of two very simple reasons, because of lacking electricity for industrial, lacking of water supply. And in order for us to come into Indonesia to invest, uh, we have to solve these two major issues uh, before we can talk about uh, increase of productions of agricultural crops. And uh, we've been working with uh, a few um, uh, technology companies from Taiwan um, in terms of looking into a, something low-tech solution for Indonesia uh, remote area, uh, because high-tech may sometimes be too complicated and expensive something affordable, adaptable to different parts of Indonesia, uh, particularly in the remote area. And this is the proposal that we have in terms of a micro-grid hybrid uh, power station in a uh, certain plantation area where it's leveraging on the biomass, which is the palm oil waste product we, by using gas, gasification process and also solar uh, energy and battery storage. Um, so our planning is to build about 50, uh, 500 of these units of um, micro station, micro grid station across Indonesia in assisting a project or cooperative project in developing fishery and agricultural development. So, so this is one example that we have built in Jambi. Uh, further up, this is the palm oil this is a palm oil CPO plant, plant a couple with a, a biomass station where this factory is self-sufficient in terms of um, energy supply. And uh, we are putting in on, into 6 km radians of uh, the palm oil estate. Uh, the reason behind is uh, we require um, the, palm, uh, the palm oil to be processed in the CPO within a short period of time so that it can ensure the quality of the palm oil before it's sent, it sent to um, refinery. This will happen to uh, the difficulty about Indonesian farmers and particularly on, a, uh, particularly on the palm oil uh, operator is because of uh, they're, facing, they're facing a lot of challenges in terms of logistics. And uh, the food usually oxidize or get rotten before it gets sent to process. And therefore, the harvest is harvest loss, and they're not able to get a very high yield or high quality of oil. Therefore, that's therefore affected the income. So our solution is to create this this uh, biomass so that the fruits can be a, the palm kernel or even the fruit punch can be produced immediately, or maybe the day after or the two days after it was uh, cut off from the tree and can produce this area before it's sent to a refinery plant. This is one of the effort to, to that how we want to promote a local economy by increase um, uh, the quality of oil. At the same time, leveraging on the palm oil waste, we were able to extend further uh, a surrounding area by developing into another industry of uh, palm oil waste management, palm oil waste recycling, and also palm oil uh, palm waste uh, uh, other uh, to complete a whole circle economy. Now, this is a plan where we have about building 500 factories, uh, create 10,000 jobs. And each station can provide 300 megawatt of power, sufficient for a small industry. And it can build more once uh, the industry is getting bigger. And then we can further build this small, small station. And this is completely independent from the main grid. And it's free for the farmers. So this is uh, what we're planning to do in Jambi, where we want to complete this uh, palm oil economy, uh, circular economy in the palm oil station by leveraging on the proximity, by leveraging on the energy that we have, by, by, by also 
leveraging on technology nearby, particularly Malaysia. We do have a lot of technology on palm oil and palm oil waste management, palm oil waste recycling. Uh, we plan to import from Malaysia and uh, trend technology transfer. For example, we're talking about after this palm oil, then we were able to produce biomass and then subsequently biofuel and subsequently even into pellet and uh, packaging materials. And this industry can actually exist, doesn't need to be traveled far to South Sumatra, uh, uh, Northern Sumatra or Jakarta area. This, this industry can develop just around the plantation area, right? Plantation area. And that's why un under our blueprint, rural industrialization is very important when it comes to promoting the welfare of the corporate members and the rural farmers. And in order to increase the productivity, the important things is always about industrialization. This is the uh, this is the things that we are planning to do. And subsequent is for cassava plantation. And this is a cassava plantation. Um, the world have high demand on cassava plantations. Um, we receive order from uh, China in terms of uh, producing one million ton of cassava starch. Uh, that's what the China needed. Giving giving they have a mature um, uh, food uh, processing uh, industry. Unfortunately, uh, right now the world populate, world supply of cassava starch is almost come to one million ton a year. And in China would like to buy all. And uh, Indonesia currently produce about only about two uh, 200,000 ton, which is not sufficient for even for domestic consumption. And Indonesia will still need to need to import from uh, Vietnam, Thailand to make up it to make up for uh, the rest of demand. So we are right now uh, working together with a cooperative in Bangka. And this is a future site of our plantation for cassava. And this is the area we're talking about. How, how do we develop a cassava industry in this area, given proximity to Singapore, proximity to Jakarta and Malaysia? And this is the area where we see potentially can be developed further uh, to bring forward uh, and an industry of Sava in Indonesia. And currently, Thailand is still the largest tapuka uh, exporter in the world. You can see down here, Kasawa start yellow color. This is the largest in the world. Uh, in Indonesia and yet nowhere near, partly because of lacking of capital, uh, lacking of uh, government policy support. Uh, the national GDP of Indonesia on agriculture is only about 10%. And I think Indonesia government should do more in terms of empowering a local community in, when it comes to cassava cultivation. Because cassava is something very simple to plant, and I think it's quite easy crops, and yet it's labor intensive and land intensive, and it requires huge capital to do so. And I believe Indonesia, if the right capital, right team, and right policy, and Indonesia can surplus any country in the world and become the largest cassava producer in the world uh, in the near future. And China is the largest uh, importer uh, compared to even Malaysia, such a small country, uh, is, is named one of the top import of the world because, thanks to the mature uh, value change of food. And subsequent Singapore and Russia. And uh, the last two items that I want to stress about is uh, on fish and fishery. And this is one of the sites uh, we a site that we identified to be further developed into a fisher industry. And what we have, we, we understand about the fishermen in, in sorry, the fishermen in uh, Indonesia, particularly in this area, Maluku area, largely because of lacking of uh, capital, lacking of boat, lacking of uh, store power, energy, and storage, uh, particularly cool storage. That's why a lot of fish was not able to uh, go into further up the further, uh, further up in the value chain because lacking of these facilities. I think this is further into look into this area need look into. Uh, we are in a midterm talk to the China right now. How do we enhance this South China Sea uh, ocean economy? And China has been um, in, interested not only a fish talk but also interested in developing a, a mature and sustainable fishery uh, industry to find a cooperation between uh, the China government and the Indonesian government. But unfortunately, it's not as simple 
because brain tap fishery it involves a lot of uh, complication. So aquaculture is the next project. So also we are we are planning for. Um, we understand the reason we bring aquaculture to the to our blueprint because in a cooperative we do have a lot of fishermen, and um, not every day they can go up on every season they can go to sea to catch fish because some of the time they should also stay at, at near the shore and if let's say we do have this crop uh, aqua farming near the on the land uh, the, the income of the corporate member will not affect it on the on the monsoon season on the season where they cannot go fishing and they can still uh, do aqua farming which is uh, on the land so this is something uh, we are we have been planning for several years and uh what we have a land here right now uh, we're going to we're going to develop banka aquaculture industry in this banka island where it consists of research center breeding center and addition center and also uh for aquaculture industry to be here and lastly i think all of that cannot be done efficiently uh without rural digitization and we have in this is a project that we uh, we're working together with China and Singapore, uh, together with Cooperative with Indonesia, in order to bring a smart solution across the value chain of the future productions in agriculture and fishery. Um, this is uh, we're talking about I deployment IoT uh, on high value crops. We're talking about uh, using sensor and uh, precision agriculture. But however, it's something that's very high cost. Something very high cost. It's only applicable uh, to uh, something very high value crops. But, uh, and, but we need a system. We need a system. This is a system that we are working to with uh, China right now, where that we, we can include all the spot of our plantation and we'll be able to identify the natural disaster, what happening. We're able to predict uh, the production, uh, uh, the daily production or money production. Uh, we will use technology. We were able to see the uh, the logistics and transportations, where the food coming from, where the food going to, um, how much fertilizers being used every day, and uh, uh, which one is not effective, and any bushfires around the area. And this is some uh, big data and ecosystems that we're developing right now within the Gaudi to ensure. Uh, in the future, if any of the food buyer from other country or even for local would like to know what happened to their stock, uh, because usually uh, a country or cooperative will, will stock up their raw material two years before, they would like to know exactly with blockchain technology, with IoT. Uh, from now, they can predict what will happen to the world, uh, particularly climate change. They will see, they will able to make preparations in terms of food shortage and raw material shortage. So this generally will increase the productivity efficiency of the agricultural uh, IoT platform. So uh, our team is now currently developing an agriculture technology program through the webs, or we tie up with uh, all the food producer um, in Malang, in uh, Bandung, uh, particularly in Java Island. Um, we're using this app after we're building up this uh, agricultural trading center. So the farmers were able to sell the apps to the center or sell the apps to the, the public with, with uh, the crops daily. And subsequently, we also not only on the food trading, but logistic wise in terms of logistic and transportation apps as well. And uh, lastly, uh, talking, about, talking about all this, we will need finance. And uh, money is always very important when it comes to the investment or any development. So, um, this is a, a financial map, root map or, or financial model. Uh, we are planning uh, with the joint venture from over, overseas or foreign uh, financial institution by leveraging on the cooperative uh, existing uh, financial model to create a P2P lending platform in between the farmers, fishermen, and the lenders. So the lender not necessarily can not only just send, the lender can be a, a bank, can be a, a PE fund, can be a venture capitalist, or even can be a, a a buyer, a food buyer, can through this platform and and sell uh, give loan to the farmer, and the farmer somehow can 
return uh, return the loan in terms of food, in terms of food, in terms of that with the agriculture supply and uh, leverage on this platform. And this is one of the uh, cutting edge uh, solution, sorry, cutting solution that we will bring forward. And we hope that with this one, we will open up more opportunity for the buyer, uh, for the global market to able to access to buy things from local and yet we come in not just for buying, but also get involved in early part of development, early part of uh, food productions by giving loan. Yeah? And then so we open up more financial access, uh, digital access, financial access to the rural folks in, uh, so that we subsequently can bring uh, to make our uh, agricultural um, uh, value chains platform a success. And these are, these are the bigger pictures that we right now uh, talking about Indu Kaude as a cooperative of agriculture and fishery, be able to embark into multi uh, multi uh, uh, diversification by receive contract farming from uh, Singapore, by contract farming from Malaysia, from Thailand. And then uh, we were able to develop a, a, a big group of uh, SME within cooperative member. They can go into agriculture business in terms of uh, supplying uh, agricultural equipment, agriculture fertilizer, and science and research. And of course, organic farm. And Singapore has been asking us to want to work with one we work with uh, Indukaude or Indonesia to plant organic food for Singapore. And then we, we were, we've been sending a lot of uh, quite numbers of, um, of uh, Indonesian farmers and the younger generation to Taiwan, to China, to receive uh, training on aquaculture and fishery. This is what this is yearly going on right now. And also subsidy called logistics and, uh, and bank, and as well on terms of R&D issue, uh, R&D tissue development. Oh, thank you. Thank you for, this is a very simple brief uh, going through of um, the possibility of uh, into Kaude, of possibility of cooperative, even though um, you are in rural area and by leveraging on right capital, by leveraging on right digital technology and right people, and then you can bring a solution to solve the world problem of food security, uh, to solve the problem of uh, to improve the well-being of a uh, rural cooperative and rural members and improve the lives, uh, improve the life and eradicating poverty in Indonesia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Felix. Let us give a big applause to our speakers. Mr. Felix has give a detailed explanation about trade opportunity and how to make it a real, uh, real result especially for SMS and cooperatives. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you are still with us and enjoying our discussion with the previous presentation of our panelists. I think now our keynote speech, keynote speaker have with us in this chat room. Hello, Mr. Fernando, can you hear me? Our IT committee make sure that Mr. Fernando can join us in this meeting room. Yes, hello, Mr. Fernando. It seems that our keynote speaker internet connection is unstable, so he's facing a difficulty to join us with us today. Okay. Oh, okay. Here I am. Welcome. To, thank you very much, Mr. Fernando. Sorry. I think you are still. I'm going to to place uh, here the to place here my uh, presentation. Yes, please. Okay, just a, just a moment. 
I'm copying the presentation to put in the Okay, before you presenting your materials, I yes. let, me, uh, let me introduce again your curriculum vitae for proposed. Okay, okay. okay. Mr. So, Sorry, let me uh, allow me to read your curriculum vitae. Can I? Okay, okay. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Fernando Martino, a Portuguese national holds a degree in cooperative management and has extensive experience in this field. He is currently serving as the board president of Academy Jose Moreira da Silva, a social economy study cooperative based in Portugal. In, in addition, Mr. Martino has also served as a member of Syriac International, Ponta Coop, and IFRS International. All this highlighting his expertise and involvement in the field of cooperative management. So let us welcome our keynote speaker, Mr. Fernando Martino to the virtual stage. Yes. Mr. Fernando. Yes, please. I'm here. Yeah. With Pedro. Can Good you share morning. your presentation? Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, yes, I yes, do. Yes, we can hear so, you. Uh, yes. So, uh, sorry about all the delay that I disturbed. And uh, I would uh, like uh, to thank the invitation to, to be with you. Uh, and uh, I think uh, that uh, now the the screen the key oh yeah no that here So, I don't know if you see my uh, presentation. Not yet. I'm trying to share the presentation, but uh, I will speak about. So, um, uh, the, the, the question of that uh, I would like to, to share with you was just uh, okay, this the key. Okay, so I thank the promoters, uh, especially Mawarun, for the invitation to share with participants of the webinar some questions and concerns about our mutual preoccupation that uh, all of us are facing in this uh, updated global reception crisis at, uh, uh, as a common problem that uh, can grow and have great impact in people's life, namely in the ones that face more difficulties and between them to the ones that are uh, rising the line of poverty and uh, the anger. So just remember that uh, these two questions are the first uh, uh, United States uh, Development Sustainable Goals. First, no poverty. 
second zero angle. So I, I share with you some uh, ideas that uh, I had been very impressed when on my visits to the Rochdale Cooperative Museum at Manchester, uh, where a poster more shocking is the one that remembers as the dramatic crisis facing uh, in the life conditions of the workers' poor class at the final of the 19th century, just uh, saying cooperatives or death. And now we can see now just in the COP27 in November 22, the United Nations General Secretary Antonio Guterres to emphasize the human global crisis saying cooperate or perish. So the, the, this asks us to promote the 17, the 17 United States goals of sustainable development, namely the 17 one that just to promote partnership cooperation to achieve all the goals till to, uh, 2030. We are just now trying to use these technologies. I have been with a problem, but they are working now with the, the support of uh, Pedro Ximenez. And uh, uh, the idea is to create new cooperation between uh, our organizations for a better world. Uh, I will make some two reference uh, about, uh, about, about two uh, important uh, contemporaneous leaders that apply as to take attention for the need to, of recognition of the cooperatives' world life impact. Just Pope Francisco last uh, uh, some years ago, taking as reference the spectacular success of the social cooperatives in Italia that had made a uh, strategic vision uh, from the first social cooperative goals. And this new big movement in Italia that also is growing in many countries of the world, in France and many other countries, this social cooperatives that uh, recuper the starting principles and make that people works for uh, communities organizing themselves as cooperatives. And another person, another Argentine person, that is Ariel Guarco, that is the re-elect uh, ACA International Cooperative Alliance president, uh, that reinforced the message just last year when we celebrated the World Cooperative Day, of ICA and United Nations with the sentence, uh, cooperatives build a better world. Next uh, one July this year, we are all invited to celebrate the next uh, International Cooperative Day with ICA and United Nations. For my part, I would like to share you some of my experience in 15 years. Uh, as um, a person with 72 years old today. Uh, just starting as an accountant, I had been working to make the auditing of uh, wine farm cooperatives in Portugal. After the Portuguese revolution, I had been involved in the creation of many associations and cooperatives, special as coordinator of a group to assist the cooperatives with starting that we had organized in the economic faculty of Port University from 75 to 77. And I am a member of uh, two uh, special cooperatives aged more than 100 years, Cooperativa de Solidade Social do Povo Portuense and Cooperativa dos Padreiros do Portuense. I am a coordinator of Uninort Intra Inter Cooperative Service and special for cooperative quality projects. I develop many functions in international organization and several uh, entities in, uh, and some as a professional paid worker and others uh, more uh, as voluntary, no paid work, always as a, uh, uh, always with the, the in intercooperative work and member of cooperatives to provide my action. 
So uh, I will share with you some examples of the cooperatives that we are uh, working with. One of them is the social cooperative in Oporto that have uh, special activities to assist the people in the funerals. Uh, uh, to there, there is a clinic and uh, uh, it is a cooperative that uh, develop a very in, important uh, cooperation as uh, social cooperatives uh, that they have put today the same principles that had started in the uh, 1989 when they start the cooperative. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Fernando, are you still with us? Hello, Mr. Fernando. It seems then the same difficulty comes again. Unstable signal. It seems that the problem is come from this steamer where Mr. Fernando are living now. And we are trying to raise him again. Okay, problem on unstable signal from our keynote speaker. Okay, because our keynote speaker have dealing with the problem of, of signal. Let's move on, all participants. I hope you still with us and continue the discussion concerning the cooperation and small medium enterprises today. So we now enter second session, Q&A session. It will be divided into main two part. First part is I read written question in the Zoom chat book dialogues referring to each of the panelists. And other part, we can have a chance to all the audience or, or the participant of the seminar to ask directly their question to each of our panelists today, first panelists to the third panelists. Okay, let me write one question from our Zoom chat box dialogues. 
The question is come from David Freitas, addressed to our speaker, Pak Pedro Simenes. His question is, GDP of Timor Leste is mainly derived 90% from oil. And non-oil is just contribute 10% of GDP. His answer is, is his question is how to improve percentage of non-oil economic to contribute economic development in Timor Leste context. I think it's the first question addressed to our panelists, Mr. Pedro Simenes. Please, Mr. Pedro, can you hear me? And Hello, Mr. Pedro. It seems that Mr. Pedro is also in his timor and have a same unstable signal to connect with us in this seminar. So let me write another question from chat boost. Zoom chat book dialogues. From Ibueni. I would like to ask Mr. Felix Oi, in facing the possibility of food recession in 2023, what type of business do you think will survive? And can the existence of cooperation help the world community in dealing with the crisis? Thank you. This is the question from Buheni, referring to our speakers. All right. Um, Mr. Okay. Felix, please. All right. Thank, thank you for the uh, questions. Um, interesting question. Um, I think business, um, I'm not able to predict uh, what business can survive. But from the basic of uh, principle of business uh, at this time, uh, I think every business can survive through any recession, uh, partly if you have a proper measure <clears throat> for your business to grow, uh, such as uh, you have uh, uh, control your cash flow, uh, when you have uh, control your human capital and control resources, and then you have sufficient bank loan, or, uh, or maybe you have problem management that I think you will survive through recessions. Because this recession is always temporary and um, it's going to come back good again. So, uh, but talking from entrepreneurship point of view, I think there are a few businesses uh, which are recession proof. Um, part of it is one of it is healthcare. Healthcare has proven to be uh, very prosperous right through the last, uh, last few decades. Um, food, uh, any business deal with food, also uh, something that um, uh, will not be lightly hit by uh, recession. Uh, maybe a little bit negative grow a little bit, but I think it'll come back soon. It's just what happened to the pandemic after two years. I think things are going back on track again. <clears throat> um, and also uh, other businesses uh, with education. Education is something that uh, could be recession-proof to an extent. Uh, it also to certain funeral business as well. So, uh, but most importantly is for any business that you must keep on uh, innovating. And any business, uh, regardless of what nature, must always come back, uh, come up to tight with digital right now because digital economy is going to be going big. It's going to be very extensive right now. So I believe that uh, when people talk about digital, Sometimes people always think about just fintech alone, but a digital um, or even blockchain can extend to other disciplines as well, for manufacturing, for healthcare, from, uh, from any type of businesses. So if you are in business or you come and plan to embark in the business or whether you are a startup as well, and ensure that you are, have, have a close relation and utilize on the latest technology of digital. Um, how does the corporate can survive uh, uh, throughout the crisis? Uh, throughout it, 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 this effect, uh, it affected us as well uh, during the last 
two years where we do see our funds coming slowly and uh, investment is slow because of the pandemic and people are not mobile. And uh, but now it's back, get back track on track again. Um, <clears throat> our investors are even ourselves are more keen to come in to Indonesia right now. Uh, we just signed a deal with uh, a Singapore company uh, to develop uh, super apps for cooperative. Uh, I think they're likely to, we are talking to um, another big company in Taiwan, talking about uh, uh, great common credit, uh, leveraging on the resources of Indonesia, where it's going to bring a lot of works for uh, investment in Indonesia one of big multinational corporations. So I think um, but it's, uh, cooperative is a bit different from the normal um, um, uh, private entity. Private entity always drive profits. And cooperative, somehow the structures are being uh, very rigid in terms of we need commun communal uh, meetings and uh, meetings and also agreement and get executive decision. Therefore, the deployment of fund or deployment capital may not be so flexible. And when it's not flexible, then therefore it may not, it may not be able to hit by uh, a certain economy uh, disaster because they, they are well protected. But I guess uh, for the last two years, uh, we see some of our corporate members are also facing a big problem in terms of uh, uh, decline in terms of uh, sales, decline in terms of productions. Uh, but I think the, the next two years, uh, it's going to be good. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Felix, for the answer. And we move, we move on to the next question on the Zoom chat box, Alex. IT team, can you present with us in the screen? This also comes from Buheni. She would like to ask. Mr. Anas concerning his materials in the context of Indonesia, what strategies must be implemented by cooperative and micro, small and medium enterprises in the face of economic globalization, even all economic, even in a world economic recession situation, so that they can survive. Thank you. It is question addressed to Mr. Anas. Mr. Anas. Right. The uh, answer for that. As as we know that uh, recession uh, are a difficult times. I think many people uh, suffer economically and even more worry that they uh, meet. But for a selected group of the professional, a recession. Uh, a recession may actually be a, an uh, opportunity to thrive and grow. Uh, uh, not every company is affected to the same degree by an uh, economic recession. Some uh, enterprises and sectors that are uh, reliant on host all disposable disposable income are likely going to see those out of a recession. As uh, we know that households tighten their belts and reduce discretionary uh, purchases. At the same time, some businesses will thrive or at least not so far suffer as much as the rest of the market. Among these are companies that provide uh, basic necessities and can be so called uh, can be so called recession proof company to the rest of the uh, market. Uh, <clears throat> is some uh, strategy. I think, for example, for the uh, uh, food and beverage business, people have their own way of coping with the recession. Interestingly, comfort food and ring are key to remaining optimistic and motivated for some. 
that exactly why the food and beverage industry remain resilient in spite of the uh, like uh, pandemic uh, in the 20 uh, and also i think uh, uh, in services like uh, online uh, freelance yeah entrepreneurs maybe don't raising uh, and laying off employees but the demand for labor remains rather than full time staff companies open or entrepreneurs often hire high quality freelance workers to meet their design and maybe uh, marketing need uh, remote uh, maybe for the uh, business uh, strategy uh, they are they they have to shift workers to require training and also uh, move workers to units plan or offices where demand is stronger and uh, maybe negotiate for re reduction in length of the work week to avoid lays off temporary uh, work uh, stoppage uh, maybe i think uh, we can negotiate uh, wage freeze or low wage uh, rise and small enterprises need to cope will redu reduce demand in their traditional market and develop products and services for the new market and also the new opportunities arising uh, during uh, the crisis. For this step, they need to help to think outside of the box. Once again, they have to try to think outside of the, the box and take initiative, initiatives to ensure that instead of being entrepreneurs in places, they are entrepreneurial in the mindset or the crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Anas, for your response. And let's we move on to the next question. Is there any question in chat box dialogues? Our committee, we have to make sure. If not yet, we can also. Okay, the next question is come from Brother Solomon Leakey. It's addressed to Dr. Anas and Dr. Felix. His question is, what is the impact of COVID-19 on cooperative and small medium enterprises in Indonesia, Malaysia, and Australia? What policy have been taken to resolve the problem? Okay, okay, thank you very much. This is the question from Brother Solomon Leki. Please, Mr. Felix. Uh, okay. <laughs> Please, Mr. Felix. The first one is, <laughs> maybe come from Mr. Felix, and the next yes. one is to come from. <laughs> Thank you. All right, this is uh, Anas. Uh, yeah. I think I will. Uh, can, you can you read the question? Yeah, the, I can read yeah. the question. I can read questions. I think <laughs> Dr. Anas will better answer, answer, uh, answer this <laughs> nah. uh, because it's in Indonesia and, uh, and I understand a bit more about it. <laughs> but I can yeah. tell, share a bit of experience about Malaysia. Yes, thank uh, you. Malaysia. Uh, um, it's strangely that uh, for the last two years, uh, a lot of industries in Malaysia are booming. Right? We, we do not, uh, during the pandemic time, uh, we can see uh, many factors are doing very well, particularly on to the semiconductors, something uh, computer chips. Uh, these, uh, that's, that is increasingly very well. Right? So 
Well, so when it comes to pandemic, when it comes to financial, when it comes to a few other things, I think it's doing very well, to be honest. Even for my a few of my friends' business for the last two years, uh, the revenue increased by 20-30% during a pandemic. So pandemic is sometimes not necessarily um, affecting, uh, does not necessarily bring a negative impact to the business. Uh, but I think for Malaysia government, uh, what the government do is also give uh, in terms of um, they provide uh, for the grant for research uh, during pandemic times where uh, they, they increase the budget of research uh, because uh, Malaysia government is very focusing on R&D and uh, we understand our economy is very, very based on OEM. Uh, we are producing chips for Apple, IBM, we're producing uh, electronic goods for Motorola, but yet, after all these years, we do not have owned IP. We are just a, a contractor uh, to the big multinational corporations. So, uh, government certainly give a lot of a grant to the SME in terms of going digital. Like, if, for example, such a small business, they will give a grant to create your websites for small business. They will provide uh, uh, facilities. So, how can you go digital in terms of uh, uh, participate in the payment gateway system? Uh, they will organize talk and they will organize uh, internet and uh, website uh, seminars on, uh, or even for business matching. And then that, this is what the government has been doing right now uh, for the last two years. Uh, and also there are a lot of fun has been going into uh, development uh, on helping a small industry, uh, particularly on construction uh, businesses where government give a lot of grant or give a lot of support uh, during time because at that time uh, private sectors are basically stopped and government have to do something so government uh, attribute a lot of fun in, term, in terms of construction and that starts two years to sustain uh, the economy for construction which was badly hit the last two years so uh, Dr. Anas uh, can you share some about uh, Indonesia or Kimola experience yeah I think it's uh, more than uh, uh, completely but I try to to add some uh, answer. Uh, as we know that uh, all the government in the world uh, have to uh, make action for the this uh, problem. If we look at the uh, formula of the macroeconomic, you know, like uh, Y is equal uh, C plus uh, I plus G plus uh, net export. Yeah, the uh, we have to focus. Uh, I mean, the government have to focus for the variable G. Uh, variable G is uh, government expenditure. Yeah, uh, uh, like uh, the problem before. I mean the the COVID nineteen. Yeah. I think if the, the uh, economic recession is not the different uh, problem, okay. And then uh, for the for the uh, economic recovery in response of the crisis, I think the government of Indonesia. Uh, major shocks as well as a growing number of low and uh, middle income uh, earn who have become uh, full liberal and are at risk of becoming uh, tomorrow's uh, poor. For the small businesses too, uh, I think are receiving assistance as the key continue to to uh, contend with a contracting economic public uh, health restriction. How about the, the, the uh, financial uh, technology? As we know that uh, technology continues to quickly advance, uh, and I believe the innovative solution provided by a fintech uh, company are becoming ever more uh, essential to the uh, financial uh, services industry. A growing uh, uh, 
tactics uh, looks to be served by technological advancement that offer uh, data driven solution. Leader in the fintech industry, uh, I think they can uh, uh, promote economic growth by expanding uh, financial opportunity for a variety of industry and by satisfying the need of a younger uh, demography. FinTech also can benefit other companies by enhancing payment methods, for example, and maybe uh, customer relationship uh, management. That's all, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Anna, for the response. I think it raised our discussion in the quarters of Indonesia. And also, Mr. Felix has already enriched us with the practical knowledge and insight how it will yield a good benefit for cooperative and small medium enterprises because we have workers also in cooperation in, in in organization in, in Indonesia, as you have so. So let's move on. Maybe there's another question to the panelists. I think the same question is referred to Mr. Pedro and Mr. Fernando, but it's too bad they cannot join with us today so that the, we can just yeah. only make a, get an insight yeah, yeah. in Malaysian and Indonesian context. It would be good if Hello. we can also have in timor -Lest context. Now we move on to the next question from chat dialogues. Yeah, selamat datang, Pak Pedro. Can yes, you hear yes, me? We, oh, yeah, thank sorry. you. Finally, <laughs> finally, because we have skipped your question because of the technical issue, but. We are happy you can join us today. And let me recite again some questions that address to you from the participants of the seminars. The first and foremost from the first question, our committee, please. So the first question for refer to Mr. Pedro. Yeah, I think I've seen the question. Yes. And probably I'll, I will also just answer the uh, the second question that was also about the uh, COVID, uh, uh, COVID, uh, you know, COVID recovery, COVID recovery uh, kind of like things that the uh, Timor Leste government has done. So I think the first question refers to how the Timor Leste government or the government or the Timor Leste as a nation uh, can actually address that. Uh, high dependency on oil and gas production. I think uh, as been uh, highlighted by the other uh, presenter, it is easier said than done. I think the easier answer is actually first, uh, you need to strengthen the, uh, the private sector and the cooperative sector so that they can actually contribute more to the economy. As it stands right now, uh, government as the, uh, as the biggest uh, player in the in timor -Lest economy, uh, uh, with 90%, I mean, of all the economy in Timor-Leste is based on the government expenditure. 90% of the development in Timor-Leste is based on the government uh, expenditure. Only 10% of the economic growth is actually based on uh, uh, inputs from the uh, private sector and cooperative. I think that is that has to be, uh, how do you call it? That has to be changed. Uh, it has to be at least 50-50 or even better the private and the, uh, the cooperative sector needs to contribute more into the uh, into the economy. The government needs to stay as a facilitator, needs to stay as creating the enabling factors and enabling environment, whereas the private sector and uh, uh, cooperative needs to step up. As I said early, uh, easier uh, uh, said than done. I think the the key the key messages are the uh, innovative and uh, uh, the knowledge of the market and also capacity to uh, address something and then persistent in what you do. 
Uh, second question, I will be very brief regarding the, uh, the intervention by the government uh, facing the COVID-19 uh, effect. Uh, as I have highlighted during the presentation during the COVID uh, uh, pandemic, the uh, economic in Timor-Leste, they actually uh, faced the downturn of economic. We had a, 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 a negative uh, growth uh, in 2021 and 2022. So the government put uh, what they call package economic recovery package. Among these uh, effort is actually to widen and intensify the safety net provided to the community by providing cash and also making sure that the government inject uh, more uh, fund into the community. One of the example of this intention is actually by providing a direct uh, um, uh, produce to, to people such as rice, such as primary necessity uh, to the people. But these produce, these uh, products are uh, bought in uh, from local product. Uh, so the objective of the government is actually to, uh, to put more money into the system and then the money can be absorbed by the uh, local economy. Now, as a result of that, um, uh, in 2022 uh, and 2023, 2022 uh, Timor-Leste had a, a positive economic growth of 3%. Uh, this year, uh, 2023, the estimates are pointing to up to 4.5% of economic growth. But again, we're still at the beginning of 2023. Uh, challenges are, are very uh, steep for Timor-Leste, given that this is the year of election in Timor-Leste. Uh, political stability is one of the, uh, the key factors for economic development. So we all hope that uh, this uh, uh, political year can uh, translate into a good result so that it can create an environment uh, for the Timor-Leste economic to grow. I think uh, so far that what I can say uh, regarding the questions. Back to you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you very much, Mr. Pedro. I've enriched us with in context of Timor-Leste. Now we move on to next question. I think our committee have noticed that some of the participants raised their hand to ask directly to one of our panelists today. So please, yeah. Time is yours, please. Introduce yourself and your question to respective. Okay, thanks for the time and opportunity. My name is Stefan Hilda Seran. I am a student from the Widya Manjira Catholic University. This question is intended for Dr. Anas. The question is, as we know in Indonesia, there are a lot of scamming cases that don't be a fictive cooperative. You think this have relation with the inflation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Anas, can you understand clearly or uh, uh, can you get the point of this question? Can you, uh, for the, the, the key point for your answer, please, uh, for your question, please? Please, Stefania, please repeat your question. Okay. As we know in Indonesia, there are a lot of scamming cases that don't by a fictive cooperative. You think they have a relation with the inflation? Ah, okay. 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 Okay, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's interesting to talking about the the inflation. As we know that uh, inflation, we can see for the 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 two side, yeah? demand side or the uh, uh, supply side. Gitu. Now, <clears throat> if the the uh, medial medium uh, small medium enterprises uh, also related to the supply, yeah? and for the demand side is uh, related to 
uh, people gitu. Nah, the problem is sometimes ya yeah, the the man side is not equal to the uh, supply side. And of course about uh, because of the uh, not equal for the demand and and uh, supply uh, can happen uh, inflation many schemes for uh, from the government try to uh, uh, to help for the small medium enterprises how can uh, the uh, the 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 company or the the uh, small medium enterprises yeah to get them uh, like uh, subsidies from government to make their the price of the product from them is not uh, make the price is uh, goes up because if the price from the uh, small medium enterprises is goes up uh, this becoming uh, inflation is goes up too i agree with the, the uh, uh, what what uh, you are already say uh, about the inflation and is not problem for the supply side but the problem also from the demand side for example if the people uh, make a panic buying that's mean the people uh, make your demand more than yeah, they also is uh, uh, maybe can happen uh, inflation. I think that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Anas, for your answer. <clears throat> I think it's enough. You can, but let's move on to the next question from all participants of this webinar. Live question directly to Ya Bak Alexius Mother, please. Thank you very much for attending these seminars and please ask your question directly. Okay, thank you very much, Father Dito. Thank you very much thank for you. all the presenters. Uh, actually, um, I have posted my question in the uh, chat room, but uh, it was skipped by the moderator. Uh, I think that um, I need to ask this question, especially to Mr. Felix Oi. Uh, regarding the possibility for input to expand to NTT province, do you have any plan to like to to uh, expand uh, the industries that you you have already de developed in the in different part of Indonesia to our province in, in NTT? Um, like uh, you mentioned in your presentation, that there are some possibilities actually um, for you to 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 um to invest or to implement in the in our province of NTT like uh, cassava plantation fishery aqua farm and so on and so forth because we know that we have the pot potentials for that but um our and there are there are some good cooperatives also in our province that can be uh, taken as um, possible cooperation with uh, input so um, that's actually my question, the possibility for input to expand to entity province. Thank you. Thank you, Maru. Thank you, Maru, very much, but Alex. Uh, thank you for the questions. Please. Uh, yes, our, our projects uh, or in terms of investment uh, very much depends on the demand, the demand and also uh, the supply, which mean um, each locations and uh, of Indonesia, uh, different parts of Indonesia do have different advantages in terms of resources, in terms of logistic infrastructures, as well as, uh, uh, let's say, if you're working with cooperative, uh, we will look into which cooperative uh, is strongest in terms of management, 
in terms of cash flow, in terms of ability. So, uh, so, so far, um, we only started the first phase. Uh, we after about 10 years of uh, consolidating and education. And, uh, this is a long way, you know, but, but when it comes to agriculture, it is a long way. Uh, it's, a, it's a long haul uh, because the capital is intensive and uh, we are exposed to many, many uh, challenges. Uh, be climate, being be people, being economy. So uh, yes, uh, when we come to Kupang, we do have a study on it, and think even the our Indo could the uh, chairman come from Kupang. I know he's been uh, looking into, and uh, we understand Kupang have minerals, and also uh, tourism is one of the important industry in Kupang. So I think when it come to food productions in the future, uh, definitely we. We, cassava is one of one of the chances as well for us to look into. Uh, uh, we are looking into Papua and NTT is one of the definitely one of the uh, we will look into when it come to cassava. Uh, but what, for, for, for the first process will stay in Bangka first as a as a demonstrations as a pilot project uh, to first meet the demand of uh, our buyer, and subsequently we explore further uh, working. With the recommendations of Indocood on which um, which uh, KUD is necessary for help, which KUD able to produce, and uh, then we will we will look into that in the future. Thank you. Eh, tambahkan moderator. Sorry. Thank, thank you, Maras. Can you, ah. yeah, Mr. Anas, please? Okay. Uh, saya belum pernah ke Kupang, tapi mudah-mudahan saya diundang nanti bisa langsung ke Kupang nih. Baik. Uh, uh, I agree with the. Uh, the answer from the uh, Mr. Felix, I think. Uh, I have tried. I have. Uh, I try to looking for the uh, reference. Reference for the uh, East East Nusa Tenggara gitu ya, or Kupang. Uh, NTT is a rich in tourism potential. Because uh, almost all the 20, I think, district in the province uh, have a natural, culture, religious, and uh, so on, and so on. The tourism sector should be the pillar of economic development in the province. But in reality, the local government uh, it's not really uh, serious to manage uh, it uh, property. I, I hope uh, the local government uh, will seriously and optimally manage uh, for the tourism potential in the uh, province. And I think the economy would certainly uh, grow uh, well, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Father, can I say something about, about that? Okay, please. Can yeah, you... it, yeah, it is very good that like uh, Pa Felix and Pa uh, Anas mentioned about um, a tourism industry in NTT. But what I was thinking that um, how can we think to shift the paradigm of developing tourism for the sakes of economic growth? What we are thinking is that how agri agricultural sector uh, contribute to the growth of a tourism industry. That is why it is very important, maybe to the decision makers or the like the cooperatives, to 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 emphasize to work more on um, strengthening the agricultural sec uh, agricultural sectors that might contribute to the. Uh, tourism industry. That's why I mentioned like uh, things like uh, cassava plantation or forestry or fishery, which which uh, are very um, significant, significant in, in um, helping the growth of a tourism industry. Because we know that tourism industry is only uh, mostly has little, so far has little contribution to the local people. What we think is from the different side is how local people are strengthened, how they are, um, um, what they are helped, um, not from the uh, industry, uh, 
tourism industry, but they are the ones who will get the benefits from what they have, like the agriculture and uh, the fishery. That's what I'm thinking. <coughs> Thank you very much. Maybe Mr. Felix can respond because you have... <clears throat> yeah, I understand about the uh, concern, uh, this, uh, but a lecture like, um, about tourism and agriculture and how uh, government has not done enough, be it the provincial government, be it local government has not done enough. Um, I came from a background, uh, I was a government before, and I do understand the thinking of a government where usually, unless you have vision of government that they will, they will think about long term, but most of politicians will look into a very short term approach. But tourism is a long haul. Well, tourism is uh, uh, take a long time to cultivate, right? So Indonesia so far, Indonesia is not very famous for tourism, except Bali or some diving destination for Australia. Um, but I think in the future, where if it's doing it correctly and uh, tourism can always go along with uh, agriculture. Uh, in the place I live in, um, ecotourism has become a trend worldwide where people go to visit the country not necessary for uh, not necessary for look into the urban and uh, the most advanced technology of the country but they're experiencing a farm life uh, bringing a family live in a farm a farm cassava a farm of palm oil whatever and this is uh, let's say the local government the police government is serious for given uh, 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 exploring the potentials of industry, uh, tourism industry Kupang, given the proximity of uh, in Australia. And Australia is very famous traveling, travel around the world every summer, uh, no, every every summer and after, uh, every summer, yeah, because in December has been, so they will come to Indonesia, they will go to many parts of Asian country. Uh, so I think uh, Kupang government should somehow uh, explore into New Zealand, Australia customers, as well as China as well, uh, as a, as a summer paradise for those who came from winter weather and also a, a place where they can experience a different uh, culture. Because everybody, when think of tourism in Indonesia, they're always about Bali. I think there is, is a high time to explore and more destinations. I understand under in, in, uh, Indonesia have a few uh, economy special zone and develop uh, in that tourism in northern Sumatra, in northern Maluku. But I think Kupang, by large, could be something uh, to kind of focus on very niche market for tourism. And that is sufficient for a start. Thank you very much, Mr. Felix. Alex? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. I think I, I must check all the committee. Is there any question? from the audience or from the chat box. Please. Is there any question from the audience or? Okay, I think that's all the question from all the participants of this seminar. Okay, one question more. Please, sister. Just introduce yourself and Thank you, Father. Thank you for the time. Uh, before I proceed to my question, I will introduce myself. I am Sister Triani Seran. Uh, my question is uh, intended to Mr. Pedro Simenes. The question is how Timor Leste cope with the low price of oil during COVID-19 especially the effect to gross domestic product. Thank you. Is Mr. Pedro with us? Okay, 
Mr. Pedro, are you still with us? Oh, it seemed that Mr. Pedro isn't with us in this meeting because of the same technical issue. So regarding this question, maybe Mr. Felix or Mr. Anas can enlighten our sisters, maybe concerning of the fall of oil prices during the COVID-19 pandemic era. Because our panelist, Mr. Pedro, is not with us this time. So can other panelists respond to this question? Pak Anas, can you? Please. Yeah, this is the specific question concerning in in East Timor context about the falling of oil price. Okay, because our panelist is not with us, so that it's we can move on to next question, live question from the audience. Yes, see, raise and function appear from Fiani Habu, please. Answer, please ask a question to the panelists. Committee, please make sure that our sisters and yeah, Priyani, please. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Let me introduce myself. My name is Fiani from Civil Engineering Study Program. Um, this, question, this question is addressed to Mr. Petro. With the threat of a global recession, it will definitely affect the high inflation rate and also the food crisis. What can students do to contribute to fighting this global recession here? Okay, thank you very much, Fiani. Yeah, your question is addressed to Mr. Pedro, but he is not with us in this time. But I think the, the same question is addressed to all the other panelists concerning how we are the student make a, contrib a real contribution in facing the threat of recession. Please. Maybe Mr. Felix or Mr. Anas can respond to this question. Okay, I, I, I try to, to answer. Okay, please. Yeah, uh, uh, the impact of the globalization, I think, uh, of course, the decline in uh, people purchasing power. Yeah. This result because of the uh, less job, I think. Uh, and also yeah, increasing the number of termination of employment uh, and unemployment. And then uh, the slowing down of smash income with a fatal uh, risk because the smash no longer uh, operating. Now, this uh, uh, what what I have, I have said that the uh, smash uh, have to try to make the good solve problem for this situation. For the student or maybe for the people, I think this situation 
uh, the good situation for we try to uh, try to help for the local uh, production or local enterprises and also local uh, product and this time how to make uh, try to to use or maybe to buy product-product, uh, uh, local-local product from the uh, uh, small-medium enterprise, enterprises local too. And then, uh, we can, I think, it's uh, more than uh, easy to solve the problem if the, the crisis is uh, coming up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Riani. Buy, don't forget to buy local product. To, <laughs> Thank yes, you. Suggestion for, from Mr. Anas. Mr. Yes. Felix, can you add? Or oh, yeah. Okay. And I think for the student capacity, uh, most important also, other than uh, reducing your spending, uh, delay big spending, uh, probably, let's say you are working part time as a student and uh, don't change job. Right, because uh, during recession time, it's not easy to get a job. Um, probably, um, if you have any student debts or debts, or then have to clear it off as soon as possible. Um, yeah, basically, if for a student, what you can do is other than studying, increase the knowledge. Uh, most importantly, uh, what the doctor did not say, um, buying local products. It's more important to um, to really understand uh, how it comes. Um, because in recession comes in every certain time, a certain period of time. And the student then you can still observe, observe what's the economy conditions and then um, how to prepare for it in the future. Because uh, as my career life, uh, we don't feel recessions. Uh, and probably you only feel, you only experience a few recession in the whole entire life, 1998, 2008. So probably every 10 years. So if this recession comes this year or next year, as a student, observe what's going on take it as a life lesson and prepare for the next one and that's all thank you thank you very much mr felix and also mr anas for providing a thoughtful answer for real contribution as a student in recent time i think we are close to an end of this session so let me conclude some remarks of all discussion from our panelists today. So then we can yield a fruitful discussion and real result from our discussion today. From all the panelists, we have known that despite ongoing threat of global crisis, Indonesia, Timor-Leste, and also Malaysia, have been some positive development in some indicator. This development are a result of various policy implemented by state. However, it is important to recognize and support the crucial role of union or cooperative and small medium sized enterprises in ensuring economic sustainability. As demonstrated by their resilience in critical time, SMS in particular, have the potential to become a strong economic force, but this must be accompanied by appropriate government policy and regulation. It is also crucial for cooperative and SMS in Indonesia to take advantage of development opportunities in the sector, such as human resources, agriculture, fisheries, and aquaculture, to ensure their sustainability during time of global economic uncertainty. Agricultural cooperatives are also important in this regard as they can provide a new avenue, a new repositioning for growth and development. To support the growth of the sector, policy and regulation from the government are necessary and in investment in rural area must be prioritized. By doing so, cooperative and SMS can become a strong economic force and contribute to all overall development of Indonesia. Ladies and 
gentlemen, it is now time to bring this seminar to an end. I would like to take this opportunity to exp express my gratitude to all of our speaker, keynote speaker, Mr. Fernando, and also Mr. Pedro, and also still with us until now, Ms. Felix and Pa Anas. Thank you very much for your insightful presentation. And I hope we hope that our discussion will enrich us and guide us in a real work depend on our real life responsibility. Thank you very much once again. And I also present my gracious to all participants in this seminar. Thank you for your kind and your patience. We are very sorry for an, the inconvenience of regarding of the technical issue of this Zoom meeting. We hope we learn together and hope you hear something new in the future. I would like also thank you to all your active participation and engagement throughout the day. Thank you all again for joining us and wish you all a safe journey home. Have a great day ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you. applause to all the participants and also with us and all for the experts. I give back to our master of ceremony. Thank you. Once again, we give applause to our amazing speakers and moderator for international seminar. And ladies and gentlemen, we are reached the end of the agenda. Me, Stephanie Burin, as a master ceremony, would like to thank the audience for the participation to all audience in Zoom online and offline. For the all audience, we will send your certificate by email. So you must fill your name email correctly. And then you must to fill attendance form in chat room by Zoom. And also to our speakers, we will send a certificate to your email. And the last, we also apologize if there are words or action that are less pleasing, especially about all technical problem today. That's all from us and thank you. We close our seminar today with pray. We'll be led by Father Sarnos. I invite the offline participant to stand up, please. Let us pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord God in heaven, we thank you for your divine providence and for your divine guidance and for empowering us in organizing this international seminar. We thank you for your speakers and participants who took part in this international seminar. Lord God, send us your spirit so that we can live out what is reflected in this seminar. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. It was in the beginning, it's now, and it will be forever. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much, Panas. Mr. Kakanas, terima kasih. Felix, thank you very much for all attendees. Terima kasih, Kanas. Mari, Thank you, Mas, Mr. Felix. Oi.